DC Comics is one of the largest and oldest comic book publishers in the world. Having been founded back in 1934, first as National Comics, then later being rebranded as Detective Comics, DC virtually shaped the superhero landscape. While the company that would eventually go on to become Marvel wouldn't be created until 1939, the superhero genre was still in the process of being developed. However, before Marvel's creation, Superman would land on the comic scene and change history forever in 1938. While no, DC did not create the first superhero, that honor goes to the character of the Phantom, created in 1936. DC, however, perfected this new and growing genre. Following Superman's creation, Batman and Captain Marvel, oh, <laughs> sorry, Batman and Shazam came into print in 1939, and the first superhero team, the Justice Society of America, was created in 1940. While I'd argue Marvel wouldn't really pick up steam until the 60s with the creation of the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, in the early ages of the comic book industry, DC had an absolute stranglehold over everything. They were the innovators, the creators, the perfectors, but that only got them so far. While, yes, DC expanded their horizons by adapting their characters into television and movies with Batman 66 and Superman 78, the expanded DC universe of characters were solely confined to their own movies and shows. Then, on May 2nd, 2008, Marvel became the innovators. With the release of Iron Man, Marvel began its cinematic universe, or a series of movies and shows all inhabiting the same world with one continuity. While no, Marvel wasn't the first to create a cinematic universe, that honor goes to Universal's monsters back in the 30s through 50s, much like DC did with superheroes, Marvel perfected the cinematic universe. At first, the MCU was slow to gain traction. The movies were relatively well received, but nothing too extreme. In the early days of the MCU, DC had released the Nolan Batman films, Superman Returns, and Watchmen all of which were also relatively well received, with The Dark Knight being extremely well received, and all of which, besides the Nolan movies, were one-offs. Then again, in 2012, Marvel changed everything with the release of The Avengers. The Avengers grossed a worldwide total of $1.5 billion, becoming the third highest grossing film of all time, the highest grossing film of 2012, the highest grossing comic book adaptation, the highest grossing superhero film, and the highest grossing film ever released by Disney at the time of its release. A decade later, in 2022, it remains the ninth highest grossing film of all time. After DC saw what Marvel was doing with their cinematic universe, they finally decided, hey, maybe there's something to this cinematic universe thing. When The Dark Knight Rises concluded Nolan's trilogy in 2012, the Superman film titled Man of Steel, which had been in production for a number of years, would be the first film to kick off DC's new cinematic universe in 2013. Initially called the Snyderverse, named after Zack Snyder, the director in charge of jumpstarting the DC Extended Universe, who had previously directed Watchmen back in 2009. However, from its inception, the DCEU was rife with a plethora of issues. For starters, the one they chose to lead this new cinematic universe, Zack Snyder, was a very divisive choice. Snyder is a very unique visionary, and I'd argue there aren't many, if any, other directors in Hollywood like him. All his films have a very distinctive style and tone, and he is the master at bringing comic panels to life in real and believable ways. Mix that with his typical monochromatic muted color scheme contrasted against main characters with popping colors, Snyder movies almost always feel otherworldly. The way he shoots his scenes, designs his worlds, and plays with colors, it's no wonder DC chose him to launch their cinematic universe. However, there's one key issue here. He doesn't understand the characters. During an Entertainment Weekly interview back when he was promoting his new film, Watchmen, Snyder was asked if he's always been a comic fan. He replied with this. I came to comic books through my mother. I loved fantasy art. I love Frank Frazetta. I went to boarding school. You weren't allowed too many posters up and everything I set up was slightly inappropriate. Frazetta's naked girls, ripped up guys. The kids were like, what the hell? They had their boy George posters up. I had crazy Frazetta. My mother saw I was into this comic called Heavy Metal Magazine, so she got me a subscription. You could call it quote unquote highbrow comics, but to me, that comic was just pretty sexy. I had a buddy who tried to get me into quote unquote normal comic books, but I was all like, no one is having sex or killing each other. This really isn't doing it for me. But it just keeps getting worse. In an interview by Hey You Guys, Snyder, when asked about why Batman kills in Batman v Superman, Snyder had this to say. Um, you know, I tried to do it in that sort of um, technical way, right? 
I tried to do it like by proxy, you shoot the car that they're in, the car would blow up, or he, the grenade would go off in the guy's hand or whatever. My, I perceive it as, a, as not um, him killing directly, <laughs> but by sort of, if the bad guys are associated with a thing that happens to blow up, that's not really, he would see that, the, he would say that that's not really my problem. Sort of Machine gun, what's that? It's like manslaughter. Yeah, a little yeah. more like manslaughter <laughs> than actual murder. Yeah. <laughs> Although I would say, you know, in the in the Frank Miller comic book that I that I reference, you know, he kills all the time. Right? There's a scene taken from the the graphic novel where he busts through the wall and he takes the guy's machine gun, and the guy's going, "I'll kill her, I promise, I swear it." And he's like, "I believe you." At the end of that, he shoots the guy right between the eyes with the machine gun in a one one shot. For reference, here's the panel he's talking about. It's left ambiguous whether or not he actually killed him. It's still highly debated today, as much as Batman killing Joker at the end of Killing Joke. Also, the following panel doesn't show the guy with a visible bullet wound in his head, so I imagine he shot him non-lethally because nowhere else in the comic does Batman actually kill. But I digress. The one DC hired to kick off their movie franchise is a visual and spectacle-based creative who doesn't like quote-unquote normal comic books and was very dedicated to his own vision at the cost of alienating fans. While in some instances it's great to have someone think outside the box and it's typically good to have a very unique distinctive vision, however, if your vision is based on an extremely popular pre-established works of fiction and it's too far disconnected from what it originally was sourced from, a source, mind you, that is nearly a century old, you will inevitably butt heads with fans. And that's exactly what happened. Man of Steel received mixed reviews and had a 56% on Rotten Tomatoes. People enjoyed the movie despite the ending, but for the most part, people were extremely charmed by Henry Cavill's portrayal of Superman. Yet, all of that tentative goodwill was instantly lost by its 2016 sequel, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. With a worldwide opening of 422.5 million, the second biggest opening for Warner Bros, and the fifth biggest opening of all time at its release. However, Batman v Superman experienced a poor Friday to Sunday hold and set a new world record for the worst Friday to Sunday drop for a superhero movie with a 58% decline. In its second weekend, Batman v Superman experienced a historic box office drop with an 81.2% decline on that Friday. And according to Slash Films, it was one of the biggest Friday to Friday drops any blockbuster has ever seen, despite not facing any big competition at the box office. Batman v Superman received 29% on Rotten Tomatoes and received predominantly negative reviews, mostly critiquing the poor storytelling and mischaracterizations of the characters. Director and longtime comic book nerd Kevin Smith even said, There seems to be a fundamental lack of understanding of what those characters are about. It's almost like Zack Snyder didn't read a bunch of comics, but he read one comic, and it was The Dark Knight Returns, and his favorite part was the last part where Batman and Superman fight. Narratively speaking, Batman v Superman did everything wrong. In the second outing of the DCEU, Batman v Superman combined the stories of The Dark Knight Returns and The Death of Superman, both of which are extremely famous and important comics for their respective characters, and both of which are so massive that they literally took decades in the comics to come into fruition. So in the universe's second outing, Jimmy Olsen is killed, Robin is already dead, Batman is revealed to be a killer, Doomsday shows up, Wonder Woman is there, the Justice League is introduced haphazardly, Darkseid is teased, and Superman dies in the end. In terms of narrative, they skipped the equivalent of three movies, if not more. So much story was condensed into one two and a half hour long movie, and they expected us to feel anything for these characters, all the while concluding with such a strange forced conflict between Batman and Superman that could have been easily resolved if Superman stopped to talk for one second. The way the story was structured would be equivalent to if Marvel made Iron Man, then immediately jumped to Endgame and still expected us to care when Iron Man dies. After the massive L, DC's losses just kept stacking up. In the summer of 2016, a few months after Batman v Superman, DC released the su- oh, shit, shit, I can't say that on YouTube. A few months after Batman v Superman, DC released the Unalive Yourself Squad, which was also a box office success, yet was critically panned with a 26% on Rotten Tomatoes, with most criticizing its overall story, strange musical cues, choppy editing, and massive tonal shift from Batman v Superman. And this tonal shift is something I want to focus on. Looking at the first and second trailers for the Unalive Yourself Squad, you could see a drastic shift in tones. 
The first trailer was somber and slow, with the second one popping with color and had an overall lighthearted tone. In response to the negative reception of Batman v Superman, DC wanted to make a massive course correction, and the first victim of that change was the Unalive Yourself Squad. During post-production, two cuts of the film were made. The original cut of the film was more in line with David Ayer's vision and contained no additional music outside of Stephen Price's score, was far more linear, and the tone and pacing were far more militaristic and, according to editor Kevin Hickman, akin to Black Hawk Down. The second cut was edited by the company that put together the lighthearted trailer and, in turn, made the film far more lighthearted overall at the detriment of its original tone. Testing both versions of the film, they ended up combining the two versions and reshooting $22 million worth of additional footage. The reshoots included an entirely different third act and multiple cut or reworked storylines, one of which was Harley Quinn and Joker's relationship to be far less abusive and much more appealing to all audiences. The Unalive Yourself Squad was the first of many DC films to be radically changed. Essentially what happened was due to the negative reaction of Batman v Superman, DC course corrected dramatically and made the Unalive Yourself Squad the mess we see today. When that failed, again, they course corrected dramatically to make Justice League. When that failed, guess what? They course corrected dramatically again to make Aquaman and so on and so forth. All the course corrections DC has made have never been gradual it has always, without failure, been incredibly substantial. Nothing subtle, everything cranked up to the max. If something didn't work, the tone would shift substantially in the other direction. If that worked, it would then maintain that tone until it inevitably failed, and then, once again, shift the tone substantially in a new direction. The DCEU was completely reactionary in all of its decisions, whereas Marvel maintained its course. Only in phase four was Marvel trying to change its tone, and you've all seen how that turned out. After Justice League flopped due to severe studio intervention, essentially stepping in and altering Snyder's plan after he had to step down due to a family tragedy, DC decided to axe anything Snyder wanted to do going forward. All of his plans for the DC Extended Universe were now null and void. So everything established in Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Unalive Yourself Squad, Wonder Woman, and Justice League was now pointless, and everything going forward had an extremely different direction and tone. Sure, some movies referenced the past, but Ben Affleck was out as Batman, Henry Cavill was out as Superman, and basically everything else was now its own self-contained thing. Looking behind the scenes, it becomes even more evident as to why the DCEU failed. In 2016, following the mass criticism of Batman v Superman, Warner Bros. established a DC film division, with DC's CEO, Jeff Johns, and Warner Bros. Executive Vice President, John Berg, as its heads in order to form one cohesive creative direction for the franchise. However, this DC film division was not its own production studio as Marvel Studios is to Disney. Johns would still report to President and CEO of Warner Bros. Entertainment, Diane Nelson, and Berg to Warner Bros. President of Creative development, Greg Silverman. In late 2016, Silverman would be let go from his role in Warner Bros, and Toby Emmerich would be promoted to president and CEO in his place. As a result of Justice League's lackluster performance, Berg would leave his position. Also, following DC's continual subpar performances, DC decided to de-emphasize their cinematic universe aspirations. Nelson would tell Vulture that, Our intentions, certainly, moving forward, is using the continuity to help make sure nothing is diverging in a way that doesn't make sense. But there's no insistence upon an overall storyline or interconnectivity in that universe. Moving forward, you'll see the DC movie universe being a universe, but one that comes from the heart of the filmmaker who's creating them. Which is an extremely over-convoluted way of saying, we're just gonna start making movies and not worry about connecting them from here on out. In 2018, Walter Hamada would be appointed president of DC Films and co-runner of the DCEU, replacing Berg, with Chantal Nong becoming vice president of DC Films. They would initially oversee the franchise with Johns as the key production team manager. However, Johns would step down from his role at DC and create Mad Ghost Productions in order to have a greater hands-on role in various DC media as a writer and producer. After Aquaman was a DC property that actually was well received, Warner Bros. CEO Kevin Sujihara said the upcoming slate of DC films would be focused on individual character stories instead of interconnectivity. But in 2021, Warner Media changed their minds and announced that future films would again be interconnected. In 2022, following WB's merger with Discovery, Warner Bros. Discovery would announce their intentions of overhauling the DC Entertainment and DC film productions. 
President and CEO of the newly merged company, David Zaslav, believes that DC, quote, lacks coherent creative and brand synergy, and is looking to hire someone comparable to Marvel Studios' Kevin Feige. Michael DeLuca and Pam Abdi were named co-chairmen of Warner Bros. Motion Pictures Group, taking over Toby Emmerich's position, with Hamada reporting directly to them. Zaslav would later state that, We're not going to launch a movie until it's ready. We're not going to launch a movie to make a quarter, and we're not going to put any movie out unless we believe in it. Later in the year, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, coming completely out of left field, said he will serve as an advisory role for the franchise, including helping Warner Bros. find their new leadership. Johnson claimed that his movie, Black Adam, would be the first step in the new slate of DC films that would expand the DCEU. Not only that, Johnson was a key factor in bringing back fan favorite Henry Cavill as Superman in the after credit scene of Black Adam. However, there was nothing set in stone. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Cavill did not have a deal in place to return as Superman, only a verbal agreement that the studio would develop future projects. One month after Black Adam's release, Walter Hamada would depart from WB Discovery, and DC Films became DC Studios, with film producer Peter Safran and writer-slash-director James Gunn of Guardians of the Galaxy fame being appointed as co-CEOs and co-chairmen overseeing all future DC projects. Gunn and Safran would halt any future DC projects going forward, and any plans put into place prior to their involvement was cancelled, including Henry Cavill's return as Superman and, in essence, hard rebooting the DC Extended Universe. Standing back and looking at this whole shit show really makes you wonder how any of this was possible. Warner Bros. was literally standing on one of the most influential pieces of media in human history and squandered it. Literally everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Everything, and I mean everything, was broken from the start. They hired an extremely unique visual director to tell a story and kick off a shared universe, changed tonal directions more times than I can count, and had a revolving door of people in charge. When things didn't go exactly according to plan, they course corrected to an absurd degree every single time and had far too many cooks in the kitchen attempting to control everything. The franchise was mismanaged, miscalculated, and misdirected, causing DC to become a far cry from the innovators, creators, and perfectors they once were. Everything they did was reactionary and made by a room full of suits instead of a dedicated creative team. This really goes to show why Marvel succeeded. The first Iron Man movie wasn't a massive success. All Marvel films prior to Avengers received okay reviews and did okay at the box office. However, what sets them apart from DC is that Marvel stayed the course. They had a plan, a goal, and a vision, and through time and dedication, they achieved them all. Currently, four of the top 10 highest grossing films of all time are Marvel properties. Out of the top 50, DC holds positions 49, 33, 32, and 25, and only one of those movies was part of the DCEU. At the time of writing this, the new DC Universe has yet to start, but with the addition of Gunn and Safran for the first time in over a decade, I could finally see DC actually creating a cohesive, unified vision. While it is sad that the DCEU wasted so many great actors, most, if not all of which, will not be returning in this new reboot, I understand the decision in wanting to start fresh. If this new DC wants to actually succeed, all they need to do is learn from the mistakes of the past, maintain course, and build the universe around one unified vision. I have total faith in James Gunn and Peter Safran, and I cannot wait to see what the future holds. But what do you all think of this situation? Was the fall of DC because of the creators or the suits? Should Zack Snyder have been allowed to finish his vision? Was there any salvaging what was left of the DCEU? Let's all talk about that in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. Until next time, take care.